Howdy. How are we doing? Back again. Just wait for a few more people to uh, to jump on the old live at fires and we'll get into it. Whilst we do that, should we open this? Yeah, let's open that. Cool. Oh man, what a week, huh? Yeah. So uh, I'm Will, I'm the head brewer here at Gosnells as usual. Um, We've got a new person on the Live at Fives, sharing the uh, the host seat. What's going on? My name's James. Um, I'm the guy behind the scenes. I make the mead whilst Tom and Will get to <clears throat> talk about it and have fun and drink. On a Friday, I'm still sweating away here, making mead. Uh, look, James, you got the best job out of all of us, <laughs> mate. <laughs> so uh, Tom's not here, as you can see this week. He is off into the woods. He actually, the first time he's ever gone I am uncontactable. I'm in a in some kind of weird little cabin out in the middle of nowhere with no reception, no internet, and yeah. no power. Yeah, he's off the grid. Off the grid, um, which is great. I mean, so we get to we get to do the fun stuff. Yeah, so glad he's gone. Um, but yeah, let's let's uh, let's. What are we drinking, James? Let's get so into this it. This is um, <clears throat> this is a tapache from Wild Beer Co. Now, tapache is a traditional Mexican drink uh, made using the rinds and peel of pineapple. Uh, it's fermented in that and then it's back sweetened with brown sugar. We actually made one ourselves, uh, which we'll get into later, but just to start start off with. Yeah, so these guys, where are these guys based? They're out in... I think they're, I think they're in Devon, I might be wrong. But they have an amazing brewery out there and, and Tom was doing something and dropped by and picked up a whole lot of stuff. I think we talked about it a little while ago when we had a, a Saturday here where we got all the, the boys back in and and, uh, and sat down and had a drink and shared some wild beers. And uh, I think it was the Cool Ship for me that was the best of it. But um, yeah, yeah, we got... Yeah, same for me as well. Cool Ship's a classic wild but, beer. Uh, so now we're, we're trying this. Uh, this is what, 6%? 6%, yeah. On the nose is like it's just like it's it's ripe pineapple. Yeah, like yeah. it's <clears throat> talking about uh, October, and I know you're very anti pumpkin beer and pumpkin spice, etc. But it has got a little bit of that pumpkin spice, and I think that's because there is. Some... Yeah, I think they say that it, they they on the front there. I think it's got uh, it's got spices in it as well. Yeah. How we doing, guys? Welcome, welcome to another live at five. Hi Izzy. Hi Lauren. So James is going to be making weird faces trying to read everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, how's your week been, James? What's been going on? Uh, it's been productive. It's been good. Um, um, in these sort of times, we get more time to experiment and look at potential recipes. Yeah. That's, really, that's really nice, isn't it? The acid profile is sick. I forgot. Like we tried this two weeks ago, and I remember all of us like this is this is way better than what we made. <laughs> But um, it's, super, it's super dry. It's super dry, but really the pine, acidic. when you smell it, the pineapple seems like it's going, to, it's going to be nice. It's sweet in the body. It's going to be like, you know, it's going to be really tropical and, and thick, but it's, it's a little bit malty in there as well. Yeah. A little bit funky as well, which is cool. Yeah. But it's really super nice. dry, a little bit acidic, and just tons of pineapple. Well, that's kind of what these guys specialize in, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Sort of alternative yeah. fermentation and different um, bacteria and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's been a really nice week in the brewery, just uh, trying out some uh, new homebrew recipes, um, looking at scaling that up to a commercial level. And yeah, we've got some cool things uh, in the world. Small work. batch programs, uh, taking all those things that we played around with and, yeah, yeah. and pushing them forward and making them, uh, and making us uh, figure out how to, how to make them at a two, 300 litre scale, oh, yeah. which is going to be fun. Um, what else do you do this week? We've got a new pallet truck this week, James. It's yellow. It's bright yellow. And of here, course. here at Gosnells, we, we love yellow. We've got yellow <laughs> yellow brewery boots. All our PPE is yellow. Yeah. Um, and yeah, even, now, even now our, even our stairs are yellow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> love a good bit of yellow. But uh, what else? What else have we done this week, James? Drank some really nice beers this week. Um, had some of what did you drink? Anspach and Hop Days cream ale. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. I had, That's probably one of my favorite from them, realistically. Like, I, they do pretty good beers overall, but for some reason the cream ale is just my style of beer. Yeah, yeah. What, what makes the cream ale the cream ale? Uh, it's just more use of uh, things like oats and corn and uh, adjuncts basically. Less on the barley and more on the on the oats and the wheat and that just gives it like a real sort of creamy texture. Yeah, it almost feels like it's got lactose <clears throat> in it, doesn't it? 
Yeah, but I don't think it does, does it? It doesn't. No, that's what I was looking at. As soon as I had it, I was like, oh, no, not another beer with lactose. Yeah. And then Which looked at the Which is what a lot, of, a lot of breweries do, but these guys, you know, they make it all out of the grain. It's great. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, guys, so we're going to be talking uh, homebrew all day today. Um, that's kind of... Um, Kind of going to be our thing of this, yeah. of this week, isn't it? So uh, we've got a few questions in over the last couple of weeks, and a couple of people asking us to do a little homebrew sort of chat. Um, so we try to do it as much as as us as possible. Yeah. So uh, we got some of our own homebrews. We're going to go through, um, you know, some of our recipes, what went wrong, what we improved, what went right, um, how to do some like fun stuff on a homebrew scale as well, which is always always difficult. Like you you find something you like. And you're like, oh, I'm going to make that. And then you get home and you're like, I don't have a whirlpool. Like, yeah. like what, what am I meant to do here? Not that we're going to be talking about hop edition in whirlpools. But, um, and also this is slightly off the back of uh, the homebrew kit, which we sell um, online. Yeah. So we get a lot of people asking questions about, you know, questions about their fermentation. And yeah, <clears throat> that's kind of the inspiration behind this week's topic. So yeah, guys, if you you missed any of, uh, any of that, uh, you know, sending in your questions, then uh, shoot them up on the Instagram live and uh, we'll answer them and try to give out some good information and create some better drinks at home. Yeah. So James, let's let's finish these off anyway. I'm just sorry, I've been sitting here just just sniffing through this. This Apache is so good. Yeah, swirling around doesn't make any better. No, no, <laughs> no it's, just, it's a false habit. I don't know where, where I've picked it up. Probably movies, James. Oh, that's really good. Mm. Righty-o. Let's get into it. Um, so what does home brewing mead look like, James? What did, what did, give us a, a, so a, I, a basic I, home so, brew kit. So a basic home brew kit is, uh, you, can, you know, just a demijohn, which is, you know, those, those glass kind of things that you see people drinking cider out of sometimes. Um, so you, you just need something to ferment in, which is, which can be a bucket with a lid with a hole in it and an airlock. Um, but I mean, the reason brewing meat at home is so accessible and so easy because you are just mixing water and honey together and then using a yeast whether that's brewer's yeast or if you have any like um bread bread making yeast knocking about at home um it's just it's super easy to make which is probably also why it's one of the oldest forms of alcoholic beverages in the world is just because it's just super accessible sugar um honey is just such an accessible form of sugar for bacteria and yeast that you know just starts working into it straight away so what would you suggest to somebody who's just starting <laughs> home brewing um what's easier like if you got it let's say beer for example what's easier doing all grain or alumi batches what's the sort of ups ups and downs of that um so all grain is just there's more process involved because you have to to get the fermentable sugars you have to extract that from grain um so then you need to get the grain you need to mash that grain, so you need to hold. Uh, you need to hold that grain at a temperature steeped in water over an hour, or an hour and a half, at a specific temperature to get those enzymes working and get those soluble sugars out from the grain. Um, yeah, you're doing like that enzyme process, aren't you? So you're, yeah, you're, you're holding it at a certain temperature to promote that enzyme. And that enzyme will cut down those more complicated sugars exactly. into more simple sugars, so the yeah, yeast yeah. can chew through them and, and create alcohol. And then, because obviously you use grain, and there's already sort of uh, there's, there's already bacteria on the grain, you have to boil that so that you have to boil your your wort um, for you know an hour or so. Um, extremely like it's all very rewarding, but it's just there's more process involved. And then going the slightly easier version of that is extract brewing um, or using uh, LME, which stands for liquid malt extract. So a lot of that um, breaking down sugar process has already been done for you. And then it's just uh, a matter of mixing that with water. That's a little bit more like mead brewing. Yeah, a lot more like mead brewing. And that's basically what mead brewing is because everything's already done for you in the honey. The bees have already broken down that pollen into... Uh, into honey, which is just super, sort of very easily, very easily dissolved uh, sugar. So all you need to do is just mix that with water and bring it down to fermentable temperature. So anything between, you know, 18 to 25 degrees, something like that, and add your yeast. And nice. then it will start fermenting away. And then you just kind of just, just let it sit. But uh, so <laughs> let, let's get to a couple of questions we got was one of the ones that, uh, Quite a simple question, but uh, when you're starting out, the, these are the questions you need someone to answer. What should homebrew mead taste like? Oh, that's a hard one. 
It is a little bit, isn't it? Like it's, yes, yeah. it's one of those questions where you're like, oh yeah, it's simple. It, it tastes like it tastes like mead. So, so, so the mixing honey and water bit, you know, like everyone's going to get that. That's the easy bit. Um, one of the main um, factors of how your homebrew is going to taste in the end is the condition of the yeast and how happy the yeast is. Um, the yeast gives off a lot of compounds, and if it's stressed or, or unhappy in any way. <clears throat> it's going to throw off what makes it unhappy. Yeah, what, what, what stresses it, yeah. So the hardest thing with homebrew is um, temperature control. Um, as, as fermentation occurs, you're creating heat in, inside the liquid and you get a sort of convection. As, that, as the fermentation gets further in the process, that heat goes up and up and up and eventually gets to a level, a temperature that the yeast is uncomfortable with and then the yeast can start throwing off uh, flavor compounds and aroma compounds, which aren't necessarily what you want in your homebrew. So, main thing for me. So, the main thing is, if you are homebrewing, um, find a spot in your house which has a constant temperature between eighteen and twenty-two degrees, and and try and keep it there. Check the temperature. Every yeah, don't of days. don't don't put it in your cupboard where your boiler is. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, which is like such a common mistake. You know, it's one of those cupboards that you have a little bit of space in. You think that's great. I'll chuck it in there, and then a the boiler runs all day, and then your ferment goes. In about twelve hours, and and smells like petrol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which we've all done, right? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've certainly have. Uh, keep out of sunlight as well. Yeast, um, yeast doesn't like sunlight. So, so the main thing here is somewhere dark. Store your must with yeast in it somewhere dark between eighteen and twenty two degrees. Um, so that's a measure. Yeah. The thing as well is because because um, mead has no organic material in it unless you're using hops or um, anything else. Um, oxygen, dissolved oxygen isn't as much of a problem because um, there's nothing to essentially go off um, in the mead. Yeah, like uh, we, we say, I think it was last week I was talking about that, uh, you know, if you're brewing in a glass demijohn, you know, you can age it in that same glass <coughs> demijohn. But if you're working in a plastic demijohn or even a plastic bottle I've seen people use, like um, it's fine to do your primary fermentation, like your first fermentation in that. But then if you're going to leave it age or anything like that, you really want to put it in something that doesn't pull as, uh, let as much oxygen in either. Even though saying like oxygen is only, is not as bad for, for meat as it is, let's say beer, it's still not great. You yeah. know? Like unless, unless you're purposely oxidizing it and you're really watching how it's going, you've got a specific flavor profile you want to get to, mm -hmm. then you sort of want to make sure that you, know, you cut that oxygen out yeah. and uh, you, know, you can age it a couple of years and it'll just get better with time. But um yeah, that, that's quite a hard question to ask. What should a home, homemade meat taste like? Um, but what um, a better question is maybe what are the what are the flavors you really don't want? Okay, yeah. In your mead. Um, so the first one for the top of me is sulfur. Sulfur, yeah. yeah. So Which is, yeast kicks off a lot of sulfur compounds during fermentation, and um, especially in the early phases of fermentation, for sugar. So yeast also always uh, puts sulfur into. Uh, into the liquid, no matter no matter how much it is, uh, anywhere from five parts per million all the way up to you know a million parts per million. Oh, it doesn't doesn't go that high, but yeah, yeah. you know th there's a tolerance level, and sometimes it can it can be a part of the flavor profile as well. It doesn't necessarily need to be an off flavor, but if you create too much of it, then it's it's uh, you know it smells like old feet and <laughs> yeah. and, and farts realistically, yeah. you know. So um, yeah, I think. <laughs> What what a meat tastes like? I really want to answer this question. It should it should have a little bit of an aroma of honey. Like mm -hmm. if you're if you're brewing with mead, you want it to smell like honey at the end of it. And sometimes that's back sweetening and you can get a bit more honey character that way, or it's really watching your fermentation, running it nice and low and, and keeping that yeast as happy as possible, and hopefully you get a honey aroma out at the end. Uh, it should be a little bit of like it should be balanced acidity as well. It shouldn't just be thick and sweet. It should be a little bit of acidity there just to help balance out that flavor as well. Mm -hmm. So if you taste it and it tastes, you know, like a kettle sour, then maybe you've got a got an infection if it tastes too too much like lactic acid, or if it smells like vinegar, then you've probably got a got an infection as well. So if you're looking to keep away from from those sort of main three, you know, the sour, the uh, the sulfur, and uh, the vinegar, mm -hmm. then uh, you're probably you're probably doing all right. Yeah. But yeah. What do you reckon we move into some of our own home brews? Because I'm excited to see how, how these are tasting. Um, so the first one we're going to go through is uh, an idea that I had about adding oak into primary fermentation. So 
when you would usually add your hops or add your adjuncts, your herbs or your berries or your fruit or whatever you're putting into your meat, I was like, what happens if I just put oak straight into the, uh, into the fermenter and I let it ferment out on that? Um, so we ran a standard uh, recipe for us anyway, which is like our 5.5 recipe. Um, so it's coming out at about 5.5% alcohol. We pasteurized it at home. We'll go over that in a minute because that's a fun process. Uh, it's a little bit of a scary process, but uh, it's also like a really, really fun process as well to sort of get that pasteurization down at home because then, then you can actually start working around with a whole new style of mead. Yeah. Um, so we pasteurized this one at home. Uh, we fermented it for about two weeks on orange blossom honey uh, with our house yeast as well. Um, so let's get into it, James. Okay. So, cheers. cheers. I actually tried this a little, a little bit before. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. yeah. Classic. <laughs> Whilst you're talking. So the honey character is the first honey thing. Honey character is huge. Yeah. Which is you know, our, our flagship recipe, right? That's, that's why we love that recipe so much. Nice and sweet, a little bit sort of a little bit citrusy, a little bit kind of lemon. Yeah, orange. which is a little bit more um, lemony than what we would get in our uh, our original. Mm -hmm. It's less apple and pear and a little bit more citrus, isn't it? Yeah. That could also be just doing it on a smaller level as well, you know, like yeah, dropping yeah. it down to five liters, uh, even though the recipe is pretty much exactly the same, scaled down. That it nest, it doesn't necessarily yeah. turn out the same, does it? Yeah, that's it. You know, also you don't have the temperature control at home. So this was done during the winter. So I think it was fermenting at about in between 16 to 18 degrees, which is optimal range um, for us anyway. But uh, So actually going back to that question, what should meat smell like? I'm, there's nothing that's offensive about this at all. So I'm, you know, to me, I'm getting a nice honey character. There's nothing that's making me go, ooh, you know, what's, what's that? What's that smell? What's that aroma? Ooh. <laughs> so this is one of those ones too where we we decided like decided to to try this and then it finished and I remember tasting it and I, I've just done it again I thought maybe I got it wrong the first time maybe I was just excited about the process and I tasted it I was like this is really cool this is really cool um and then I'm like oh maybe we should add some oak into the primary about 5.5 and you're like we can't really scale that up um I don't know how we would just truck staves into the into the tanks and and hope for the best you know oh man that smells great tastes great yeah it tastes really clean really sweet so what for me uh, what the oak has brought to this um is a little bit of that kind of a creamy uh like vanilla sort of flavor and, and a creamy texture and also a little, a little bit of tannic structure from the tannins in the wood. Yeah, you're not wrong. Like it's a lot creamier. This is this is uncarbonated as well, so it's a, it's uh, it, it tastes a little bit sweeter just because you don't have that carbonic acid yeah. lifting it up and and sort of uh, just making it feel a bit more sort of light to drink. It feels a little bit heavier. Um, but yeah, you're right, creamy, and it, you do get that. Li it, it kind of feels like it's spent two or three months in oak. Mm -hmm. Like it's just got a little bit of roundness to it. Um, and a little bit of that tannic like pulling back dryness at the end. It's a longer, yeah, and it's nice. Yeah. It, it, it finishes a bit drier than, than usual. <clears throat> That's really cool. That's I don't really know nice, what we yeah. can do with that recipe though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, but, definitely, it's definitely the, a, a way to look at some stuff. Just right? a bit of context though, what does oak usually um, bring to the... Depends how you use it, right? So exactly what we talked about, like a little bit of tannin structure, a little bit of, uh, you know, depending on depending on what oak as well, how much vanilla you get. Like an American white oak will be a little bit, little bit more vanilla -y, where a Hungarian or a French oak will be a little bit less. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's called vanilla in the actual, in the wood, there's, the compound's called vanilla. Um, sometimes you can get some spices from it as well. Yeah. Um, it also, like when we use barrels, it, it's, it's also like, um, it's also like adding um, just a little bit more character, a little bit uh, like the tannin structure makes it a little bit longer. So then you get a little bit more time to sort of work your way through the palate. You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more smooth, a little bit rounded. Also, you know, when you're, depending on the ABV as well, that when you're aging in barrel, the, the alcohol uh, reacts with the polymers in the wood and that creates some, uh, so like a biochemical reaction that creates some new compounds that you necessarily can't get from fermentation. Uh, or get from the the primary product, so it's something that's just coming from that that reaction in the barrel, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, 
And did you say as well, like just during fermentation, because you have so much action going on, you have more of that, you're pulling more out. Yeah, and, and you, you don't have the oxygen as well, right? So a little bit of part of that, that like we do a lot of barrel fermentation here, like you do with uh, um, some white wines, that um, you want to get a bit of that oxygen into the, into the fermentation. You also want to get a bit of that wood character in the fermentation as well. But yeah, this is this is cool. Very happy with that. Very nice. Hmm. But like clean, I said, I clean, mean, no. sweet. That's the other thing. Like it is super clean. Like if you if you brought me a home brew like that, I'd offer you a job. <laughs> but uh, cool. Where do you want to go next, James? What are we thinking? Uh, we've got a couple more questions on here. Oh yeah. What equipment do you need? What equipment for do you need for home brewing home meat, brewing. James? Um, the basic. So yeah. We went over the, the basic. You just need a yeah, demijohn, yeah. some just honey, some, water, yeah, and yeast. Just honey, water, yeast. An airlock, and airlock's really important. Um, yep. Because as fermentation occurs, you're create, the yeast is creating CO2. That CO2 needs to escape from the vessel, but also you need to create um, create an airlock. So as that, the airlock helps the CO2, the CO2 escape and not let anything in. Yeah, basically. So that's that's really good, and yeah, just something something to mix the honey and water together in. So if you're jumping up to the next level, if you were at home and you're like, okay, I've nailed down this this process. I've got my demijohn, my yeast. I, I've got I've got no off flavors. What would be your next bit of equipment for your for your house or homebrew just to make your meat a bit better? So so say that again. So if you're you've got your your demijohn, you've done your recipe, got it. You've made good mead. Um, you're happy with it, but you want to go to the next step. If you had to buy one or two things more, what would okay, you buy? Okay, so you'd want to buy a secondary demijohn or a secondary fermentation vessel. Um, that's just so that because as as the yeast finishes up the sugars in the fermentation, it will drop to the bottom. Um, and there's no harm in leaving that finished mead on the yeast. Um, yeah, yeah. Or the, or the lees, as, as you call it. Um, but you might want to do something. You, you might want to mix... Some purees into it, or you might want to mix something else into yeah, it. Yeah, fruit additions, right? Fruit, you really don't additions. want a fruit on the. You don't, on, you don't want a fruit on top oh. of the yeast. Um, necessarily. You, can, you can, you can, but sometimes you don't want to, right? Sometimes yeah. you you don't want too much of the yeast character. But for maybe for like a clarity reason, every time you separate the meat away from the the leaves that settled on the bottom, um, you, you're just creating Ooh. more potential for clarity, which is always, which is another thing that. Some people really want in their mead. Yeah, not everyone, yeah. But... not everyone. Not every mead style, but some mead styles do do go for that. Yeah. And look, 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 looking for that crystal clear. Yeah, kind of which thing. like we, we do. You, know, you sort of see the the sporadic sort of color and and clarity that we've got here, and each one of those is is based on uh, you know a different style or a different outcome that we wanted to get from it. So the other thing is a siphoning hose that will just help you move the liquid easily without any you know. Without without remixing the yeast up or without any um, without oxygenating uh, the finished mead, uh, yeah, 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 I would agree with that. Like I'd agree that the the next thing I buy is another demijohn, right? Because then even if I'm not using it to rack into secondary, I can just do two meads at the same time. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that that moves us nicely into packaging, yeah, which is um quite a big. Yeah, There's so a lot, lot of things you can do with that. Yeah, generally, like if you're making a meat at home and you're you're not doing it carbonated, you know you can just siphon it straight into a bottle, um, put a cap on it, and you're you're good to go. As long that as your so. fermentation's finished, then you won't get a re-fermentation because that's where you want to make sure too. Like once your fermentation starts, you really want to give it some time after it's finished to make sure that it's finished. Yeah, you know, and they always say you know once you start seeing the bubbler, like your airlock starting to, to push out CO two, you know when that gets going, you wait till it's about you know one. One every ten seconds, would you say? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, one every ten seconds, and your fermentation is pretty much, you know, pretty much finished. Give it a, another few days, just watch it, make sure you know that it's just not, you know, it didn't get cold overnight and slow down a little bit. Just make sure it finishes out, and then you can bottle across. Um, and what about spot? What about sparkling mead? Sparkling mead's a little bit more difficult, right? Because then you're playing yeah. with pressure, and that's always a terrifying thing. With all all home, home brewers have. <laughs> Have bottled up a, a load of bottles and gone. Great, I'm done. That, that was a good bottling day. Spent all this time making it, fermenting it, letting it age out. Then we, you know, back sweeten or add a little bit of sugar for carbonation, and then put it away in the cupboard. And then you'll be asleep one night and you just hear bang, yeah. bang, bang. You're like, ah, 
do I get up now or do I just <laughs> yeah. let them all explode and clean it up in the morning? Um, because the danger is what? You you rack your mead into bottles when it hasn't finished ferment, fermenting and over time, um, because it's still fermenting slowly, you're still creating CO2 and gas and pressure in that bottle. And um, I mean, we, you, you know, you might have champagne bottles, you might not, you might just be using reusing wine bottles, which aren't really... Or even reusing old beer bottles or something like that, yeah. you know, where these ones are uh, rated to about six, seven bar, as you know, with champagne, it, it's, it's very sparkling, it's got lots of carbonation in it, where beer bottles are, what, three, three bars, so almost half as much pressure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, when, you, when you're doing that, you really want to make sure that... Or less, like... Because you know. the other thing is, like, it can be quite dangerous as well, you know. The, um, the main thing is that you don't know, and that's, that's yeah. the scary bit. You don't, you don't want bottle bombs, you don't want anyone picking up that. And that's where pasteurization at home is really cool. So the, the question was, like, how do you package mead at home easily and not have to worry about it? So my suggestion would be go still, mm -hmm. um, go into wine bottles, uh, make sure that um, wine bottles or beer bottles, but make sure that you, you cork them and you cover them um, or, or you put a crown cap on there and you make sure that no oxygen can get in and that'll slow down the deterioration process as well. Um, and you want to keep them, like your fermentation, stored somewhere uh, out, of, out of direct sunlight, out of the heat, you know, in a, you know, in a nice sort of ambient temperature. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, you know, mead will last for years. You know, I've had a mead that from, uh, from uh, one of my, my girlfriend's uncle that was, you know, 10 years old that he just had stuck away in the back of his farm shed oh those are, those are always the best stories and it was he yeah. goes when i when i made this it was the worst thing i ever made and he goes it took about five years for it to start to to uh to turn start to turn and then by 10 years ago it's the most incredible mead i've ever made so that's another thing that mead ha um but that's another different thing about mead as well if after you've packaged your mead you don't like the taste of it straight away just put it away and but what, what, what sort of taste are you talking about? Obviously not if it's full of sulfur or it smells like vinegar or it smells like we talked about before, those, those common off flavors you want to be looking for. If it's a little bit too boozy or, you know, some of the other things we yeah, don't yeah. look after the yeast as we were talking about before, that if it's a little bit too boozy or it smells a little bit like, like petrol or a little bit like methylated spirits or something like that, those alcohols will start to break down over time. Yeah. And they'll, they'll become a little rounder, a little nicer, and sometimes they can actually come out as really, really nice flavor profiles. Some of those ones that I've had where they broke down, it almost comes out like tobacco and leather after three or four years where, of course, I didn't taste it for this one, but I assume that it was, it was horrible when it, it was made. It will change, like in my experience of this, it, it changes a lot quicker than, uh, than wine. Um, wine sometimes you have to let that age for a long time for those compounds to break down and to change and for those spiky flavors to settle down a bit and with me like I, I've tasted something at the end of fermentation really really been quite disappointed and then put that away come back two weeks later and it just and being like really proud really proud of it so talking about that what, what what's your best and worst homebrew James my my worst homebrew is I made and this is just this is just completely like it's about a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. <laughs> so not I, that long ago, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah it's not that long ago. But it was when I started here, and, it, and like working at Goswami was my introduction to mead. Um, and I started home brewing mead at home pretty much as soon as I started working here. Um, but the first thing I tried was like a hopped mead. Yep. And I think I think I used bought some. I think I used um, Centennial hops, and I did not use them right at all. I. I I was putting my uh, my must, so I mixed my honey and my water together, and then I started boiling it to kind of replicate the process of making beer, because what I wanted to do was extract the bittering compounds from hops, put them in a little, put the hops in a little bag so they didn't just go everywhere, and then the bag split, and the thing. So why? So I'm, I'm talking about like hopped pellets. So what I ended up with was just like a, a green tinted mead. Um, and I remember that. that was like it was really bitter. Really. I remember you bringing it in for me to taste as well. Yeah, give this a whirl and I'm like, oh. Oh, no thanks. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I, yeah, but I, but I, I went with it anyway and I packaged it. And what I ended up with was basically just like mint juice, like really herbal yeah. minty juice. And it's too much, like a little bit of hops. You know, like it's it's the other side. It, it depends where you use them, right? If you're yeah. you can always dry hop really late and keep the oxygen out, and you've got it great. But if you add too much hops and let it sit, something pops or breaks, as you're saying, then you know 
it's like eating a raw hot pellet, which is, you know, <laughs> yeah. not, not exactly the nicest thing. Uh, but then going on from that, the, the oh. best homebrew I made was I made a sizer, um, got a really nice shop around the corner from where I live. So I managed to get my hands on some really nice apple juice. Um, so I used that. So a sizer is um, half, half cider, half mead. We so just made one of those, didn't we? We did, yeah, yeah. Did a little, little collaboration with Hawks, which yeah. was, I was really impressed with that actually. It yeah, that, I, I was very, very happy with that. Um, but yeah, so half the ferment, to like, up to about half the fermentable sugars come from apple juice and the rest is, is honey. Um, and I, I made that, made up to about 8%. And I very, I very much had that experience of like finishing the fermentation, trying it, being a bit like, oh, this is pretty meh. And then just keep just putting it away for like a month or so. And then I brought it in, I think I brought it into work one day when we were having like a little, a little social. Yep. And, Classic um, work, Gosnell Social. Yeah, thanks Tom. One every week. Well, yeah, one every, <laughs> one every year. Um, <laughs> So had, yeah, so we had our yearly uh, Gosnell social, and uh, the guys are actually quite impressed with it, uh, yeah, yeah. which made me feel good, and yeah. that's what home brewing is all about. Yeah, that's it, bringing, bringing bottles around to people where they don't have to drink it and pretend like it's good. <laughs> yeah. We've all got that mate that always brings you something, he's like, oh, I brew this, he's like, oh, great, do you want someone, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm thinking about driving tomorrow, I'll yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have any more of that. I've actually only, got, I've only ever really had honest feedback about my home brews, which has been good, and nice. a, lot, like a lot of the time it's been like, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it's okay. Like, it's not, I wouldn't choose to <laughs> it's drink drinkable, it. It's drinkable, right? It's drinkable. But, but that just makes it, that just means that when I do get like, this is actually really nice. When I do get the, the really good compliments about it, you know, it makes me go, okay, yeah, I'm actually getting better at this and this is cool. And it's just so much, it's so much fun as well. Like, you just, yeah, you know, there's some, some really... Something really nice about night, you've got something fermenting away in a cupboard and that'll be ready to drink in a few months or, you know, as long as you want to age it or whatever. But uh, yeah, remember guys, if you've got any questions about home brewing, chuck Same them up in the us. chat and we'll get through them. Um, we're going to jump on to another one now. Um, this is a ginger beer with, with honey. Oh, man. So instead of making like a, uh, a ginger mead, um, you know, like it actually be quite difficult. We had a bit of a chat with uh, Y Valley on our Instagram live a little while ago and we are talking about how they use, how they created their ginger and how they went through you know the process using powdered ginger or smashed raw ginger or creating a ginger tea. Um, we decided that we would do some homebrew trials on ginger and um, we ended up going for a traditional ginger beer style but with honey. So we uh, created a uh, I think it's called a ginger bug. Yeah. So you're actually using the skin and the uh, the flesh of the ginger as a wild yeast starter. So you sort of give feeding that little bit of sugar and getting the yeast that's actually on the the ginger root to build up, and then you use that to ferment the rest of your uh, the rest of your meat. And then you keep the you just use a portion of that bug, and you can keep yeah, and you can keep that bug running almost just, like a like a, a sourdough, sourdough starter. Right, right. Yeah, and you keep that running, and uh, we we put that in there. We put a little bit more ginger in there, and then we let it ferment. Uh, I think we got up to about six percent. Nice. Um, and this one again is still uh, just. Same process, doing it at home. Pasteurization is always a little bit more difficult. So we let this sort of run itself out. So this is stable, but still a little bit sweet. The 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 yeast that we captured from the ginger didn't uh, attenuate as far as brewer's yeast or, or or you know wine yeast or any of those sort of yeast generally would, because that's why you select those yeast because they number one they they produce. Uh, you know, good sort of uh, phenols and 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 uh, esters that that are complementary to whatever you're using it for, or even just nice and fruity. Uh, they attenuate; they've got a high alcohol tolerance, or they attenuate fast. You know, there's lots of different reasons why you select yeast, but this one, of course, was wild, so we got what we're given, mm -hmm. um, and it just didn't attenuate as far. But that's that's fine. I, you know. Um, so it's likely that that yeast that was on the, the skin of the ginger was maybe better at producing CO2 than it was alcohol. Yeah. And that's where you get the differences between the different types of yeast. But um, yeah, so let's get into it. All right. Yeah, this is super, super gingery. This meat sounds brutal. Love it. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So the first thing you put your nose in there is it's, it's ginger. Right, like made it the wild yeast from ginger, added a ton of ginger. But it's more like a it's it's more like something your grandma gives you when you're ill. This is like a a hot drink 
with mm. ginger in it, sweet, sweetened with honey and a little and a little bit of lemon as well. I don't, I don't think there is lemon in it, but it has that. Yeah, kind it's of got a little bit of citrus. Like it's got a little bit of like lactic acid, right? It's almost yeah. like lemon sherbet. Because you're not just going to get Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae, like a like a, a brewer's yeast. You're also going to get uh, lots of other um, bacteria and yeast as well. Um, so they're going to give you some 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 different things. So like lactic acid bacteria, which you might get in it, which you do get in this as well, is going to produce lactic acid, which is uh, you know quite quite tart. So that's going to help balance out the sugar as well. But it's yeah. also going to make that smell a little bit more like lactic acid, which to me smells like lemon sherbet. It's oh, it's beautiful, isn't it's it? Gorgeous. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Such a nice like, smell. Yeah, like it's that, that acid profile. But if you get a nice, clean um, sour beer and you get that smell that, you know, oh, it's not lemon, but it still smells sour, that's uh, that, that lactic acid. It's a rich, full kind of sour, isn't it? But you also get just a little hint of spice as well, like a little bit of cinnamon. I don't know whether that's my brain just sort of, putting that together but when you said um you know something that your mother would bring you it kind of reminded me of like uh my my grandfather used to give me these um homemade ginger biscuits right and that's kind of got a little bit of that yeah, in there yeah. too yeah, like yeah. a little bit of sweetness a little bit of cinnamon a little bit of ginger and also that kind of a little bit of yeasty a little bit yeasty yeah, a little yeah. bit bready my, huh? my voice has gone really croaky today <laughs> Happens to the best of us, James. Mm-hmm. My voice is always croaky. <laughs> my normal voice is, is weird. I think if I come into work with my normal voice, nobody would... Uh... Which is really high, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, it's hugely high. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> yeah. Are we all done? <laughs> um, with, with a thick Australian accent, though. Like, yeah, brilliant. Um, that smells way sweeter than it tastes. <laughs> yeah. I was like already into that going like, yeah, it's going to be super sweet. But the acid at the back just cuts through and and sort of balances it out, which is cool. So there's no heat from the ginger either. I was kind of no. expecting a bit more heat from the ginger by how much ginger was on the nose. This carbonate would be... Yeah. Yeah. It'd be really good. Mm. So, James, homebrew questions. What would be your three tips for making better mead? For making better mead? So we talked about before your next little bit of equipment, get another Jemmy John rack. Um, so you let's say you got to that, you got to that sort of process. You've you've racked in your secondary. You've learned how to fruit, um, and you just want to raise the level of your of your homebrew. So it's all about like end of process. Anywhere in the process, Anywhere in the process. it's just going to make your meat a bit better. So just give us one one but, thing. Yeah, that you... One thing first thing foremost is um, cleanliness. Sterilizing everything, that's that's a given. That's not really a tip any, for anything. That's just, yeah, yeah. That's that's classic 101. That's make 101. sure everything's clean. Clean your surfaces, clean all your equipment, make clean sure your sterile. hands, even if you're working with clean fruit and stuff like that, your hands are covered in bacteria. Um, you know, it's not bad, but if you put that into into your fermentation, you know, you can have some some stuff on your hands that'll turn your meat bad, especially when you're aging it and that has enough time to sort of catch up. Especially yeah. something like a cedar bacter. Like I know we don't have a lot of cedar bacter on our hands, but let's say like I do at home, I've got a vinegar mother on the bench and I've got my kombucha over in the corner. And if I'm brewing and I've, you know, touched that or something like that and I put it in there and six months later my favorite mead now tastes like vinegar, I'll be pretty pissed off. Yeah, you don't want that. Especially because like you're gonna end up aging this stuff and you know you want your you want the time you put in to to come out, to come out good. Um, temperature control is the main thing, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, if your if your meat is too hot or too warm, before you pitch your yeast, make sure your your meat is at a good temperature between the eighteen and twenty two degrees, twenty five degrees even. Um, and you want to try and keep it between the eighteen and twenty two degrees during fermentation, because if you if you don't uh, get a hold on that, you're really rolling the dice on what your end product's going to be like. So what, what's your number one tip? Uh, my number one tip is temperature control. Temperature control. Check the temperature of your knees. Um, if it's too warm, move it somewhere cooler in the house. If it's too cold, move it somewhere warm in the house. Just try and keep it sort of, you know, consistent to, to, to some degree. So um, guys, um, James is going to duck off for two seconds. We just got a delivery. So he's going to go do that. I'll, I'll go through my two other tips. I think um, I've been uh, through this... Uh, a few times on our on our podcast, and that is that when when uh, you want to make your uh, mead just a little bit better, use tea. Like tea does what the oak and primary does there, and and it, it adds a little bit of tannin structure. It adds a little bit of length. It also allows you to add a bit more flavour and 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 um, 
you can then use different teas to create different profiles. And, and that's something really easy to use. It also gives nitrogen to your yeast as well and just allows you to then um, play around and experiment just a little bit more without necessarily changing up your recipe too much. If you add tea, it, it doesn't really uh, pull away from anything you do. You can add tea to almost any meat, and I promise you it'll be, if not better, at least different but not worse. Um, but my, my other tip is temperature control. Uh, it's one of those ones that, you know, it's really hard as a home brewer um, and it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to do uh, if you're just putting it in a cupboard, um, you know, but, you know, choosing which time of the year to brew as well is a really good time, a really good thing as well. So if you're in the winter, go ahead, brew as much as you want. You're going to be okay. If you're in the summer, maybe you want to start choosing your yeast specifically for that brewing process, you know, something like a, a wine yeast that, that uh, has a temperature range between 18 and 30 degrees. That'll allow them to, to ferment um, up to that temperature without producing a whole lot of phenols and a whole lot of things that you don't want uh, in, your, in your meat as well. So I was just going over that temperature control would be one of the ones at home. So uh, a good way of doing that, which I suggest to people, is um, putting your demijohn in a bigger bucket with water. And that'll just allow, because what, what happens during the fermentation process, uh, the yeast actually create heat while they're chewing, you know, converting sugar to, to alcohol and CO2, they actually create some, some um, fermentation temperature. So that'll raise your temperature up. If you put that into water, that'll help just disperse that heat a little bit. If you change that water each day. Yeah, but also you used a, um, we, we did something uh, with that. We, we used an aquarium heater, which are quite cheap and easy to get hold of. And then you just, you, if you put that aquarium heater in the larger bucket with water in it, you can actually regulate that water temperature yeah you can you can rate it's, it's good for raising temperature and it yeah. won't necessarily help with with cooling it down of course yeah so we used it because we were and that, that was the next one if you don't you know you don't want to use a wine yeast if you use something like a kavik yeast which which loves to ferment at really high temperatures and ferment super clean at high temperatures then yeah put it into a big bucket of water you know you can even um uh, you can get those little mats that you use for uh for growing seedlings that's right yeah, yeah. um and you can get one of those from your home brew shop and you can <clears> put that on there and you can regulate your temperature that way as well so it'll help keep the temperature up during the night or at least keep your temperature uh within a a good range as mm -hmm. well so you don't want to be you know super hot during the day fermenting and then during the night it crashes out you're really stressing that yeast with the with the temperature change and if you're lucky enough to have a second fridge, which I don't, I don't know anyone who does, but uh, yeah, <laughs> make that your fermentation fridge and uh, keep it nice and cool. But yeah, I think that's, that's the three tips, right? I went, um, we had James's tip, which was? Um, first tip was sanitization, cleanliness. Yeah. Temperature control. Temperature control. Uh, and the third one was tea. Tea. Yeah, so adding tea, I was just saying to everybody that uh, adding tea to anything will just make it a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, well, I did. Well, because you're getting that tannin structure. You're getting the tannin there. structure, you're rounding it out, you're also giving some nitrogen to your yeast as That's well. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and it's an easy way to start playing around um, with different flavors by just changing through your tea. So it means your recipe doesn't have to change, but you can get lots of different stuff out of your tea. That's something we didn't talk about actually, um, is yeah, and, uh, some nitrogen source. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that, yeah. Um, so for, so for making so for making meat, unlike with wine or beer, um, so yeast, like any other living thing, needs more than just water and sugar to do its job properly and sort of you know get along. It needs a source of nitrogen. Um, fermentation for beer, it gets most of its nitrogen from uh, fats and lipids from the grain. For wine, it gets that it gets the nitrogen from t um, compounds in the skins and tannins. For meat, because it's just sugar and water, um, there isn't anything for the, the yeast to really eat and, and survive on other than just the sugar. So adding um, some tea, or, tea herbs. or herbs, or if, if, you, if you can get your hands on uh, uh, dimonium phosphate um, or DAP. Yeah, or Fermade, Fermade O. Fermade as well, yeah. If yeah, they, they these sort of things are really yeast defined. nutrient from your, from your home brew shop. Yeah, that's it. Um, that, yeah, will, that, can... that will really give you a happy, happy fermentation. All right, let's, let's move on. I just realized we've been here for now 45 minutes, James. Oh, wow. So we've got a couple of more questions that we need to get through. Uh, so we selected about five or six questions from uh, all the ones that everybody sent in. So thank you to everybody who sent us questions in and hopefully we covered most 
uh, most of those sort of topics. I think we tried to, even though we, when I answer the questions, we try to make sure that we, we covered some of those ones that people asked. Um, so one of the ones uh, that was asked was, is weak and short bubbling during fermentation bad? Uh, yeah, generally you can sort of tell the health of your fermentation by how fast your bubbling is going. So if, if at the start of fermentation, or if two or three days in, it's only going one every 10 seconds or one every sort of 15 seconds, you've probably got a slow fermentation, uh, which means there's not enough oxygen in the original, uh, in the original mass you created, or there isn't, there isn't enough for the yeast to really be feeding on. Yeah, so there's a, there's a reason why the yeast isn't happy. Though sometimes you can have a raging fermentation, you might even just miss it at the start and it ferments out in one or two days. And that happens a lot with, with mead is then you know you chuck everything in, you over pitch a bit of yeast, and because the, the sugars are so simple and so readily available, the yeast just go absolutely crazy and yeah. just chew through it all. So it could be under pitching um, that you're if, if it's slow. Um, so what, what, what are some of the corrective actions you can take? So you can uh, so one thing that I would do is first off taste it. Mm -hmm. You know, is it is it still super sweet? Is it still as sweet as when you started? Uh, or is it dry? You know, if it's because dry... Because it's dry, it means your fermentation has just gone in and out. Yeah, it's overnight. gone straight through. Yeah. So if your bubbler looks like it's only just running through lightly, but your mead now tastes dry, you might have missed the fermentation or maybe there wasn't, uh, you know, maybe not brewing a super high gravity and there's not as much sugar in there. Um, and then... Um, yeah, you can just sort of... Try re some yeast, yeah. Yeah, so let's say it's sweet. Um, then you can culture up some more yeast and uh, preferably the same yeast if you kept a little bit left over and then re-pitch that and hopefully, because uh, that's called a stuck fermentation, so hopefully you can unstick that fermentation. Um, or you can do a yeast rousal. Um, so that's just, just moving the liquid around, getting that yeast back up in suspension um, yep. and also feeding it a bit of oxygen. See if you can kickstart that yeast back into action. Yeah. Or, yeah, raising the temperature. What can go wrong during brewing slash fermentation? So we've got another question there, which is uh, what oh, should be done to fix slow fermentation? Yeah, it's what we just covered. So to fix a slow fermentation, uh, to repitch the yeast, um, sometimes, you know, it, let's say you're doing a, a, a 5 or 6% and you go through and you've got a slow fermentation and you don't want to have to repitch the yeast. Might be one of those times you have to dump a batch. Yeah, um, I've, ne I've never, never, had, never, I've never, never, had never to done do that. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'll go through my best and worst uh, at the end of my fermentation, but uh, of my home brews. But yeah, I definitely had to dump a couple. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, the other thing is to have a look at it and go: is if it's dry, maybe you can add add some more honey. Yeah. You know, let's say you started off nice and light, and it raged through, and you've tasted your mead. It tastes dry, but it still smells good. There's no off flavors. It didn't produce a lot of sulfur. Then but, maybe you could do a, another fermentation, like a second fermentation over the top. Maybe put some fruit into it mm -hmm. um, and see if you can get that going. So, you know, grab some frozen cherries out of the fridge, re, you know, get them back up to room temperature and, and, and chuck them in your FE and allow that yeast to start getting, getting going again. Also, yeah, if it's, if it's, if it's a slow fermentation, if it's tasting fine, um, you know, the, the sugar's getting eaten up and converting into alcohol, yeah. um, then you might just have to just leave it, let it, let it run its course until it stops bubbling. Yep. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so hopefully uh, that answered your question, Arthur. But uh, yeah, otherwise, if you've got any more, just, just chuck them up and we'll try to work it out now and uh, get, get you brewing. Um, one of the other questions was, uh, what can go wrong during the brewing fermentation process? Well, that, goes, that just goes back to what we were just talking about, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah pretty much. So we've got it covered too with that. The other thing is um, what can go wrong is that, you know, you can get too cold and your yeast gets stuck. You know, um, it can get too hot and it runs too quick and produces bad off flavors. You can get an infection um, from, from, uh, from something you've added or it's something you didn't clean. Like we've all been there at home and we're, you know, it's a Saturday and you're having a couple of beers and you're doing your home brew and you forgot to, you know, to sanitize your funnel or sanitize your spoon and, and that just ruins your whole day. But um, yeah, so you can get an infection um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, you could just, you know, you could get a whole lot of foam happening when you're brewing and it just pumps your airlock out and you come back and you've got yeast and, and, and mead all over the floor and, you know, sometimes you get that with certain yeast as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
How do you fix problems during the brewing fermentation process? I just had a question here. Sorry, I've missed most of this. Been on a call, really interested in bottle conditioning, sparkling mead. Any suggestions? Yeah, cool. So uh, <laughs> let's go with, we'll answer that one in a sec. How do you fix the uh, <clears throat> problems during the fermentation? So like we talked about before, if it's slow, re-pitch. Uh, if it's dry, maybe add some fruit and get that that, that fermentation going again. Yep. If it smells like vinegar or if it smells too sour or it smells like like farts, probably start again. Yeah. Uh, if it smells <laughs> like petrol, um, put it into a bottle, store it away. They're probably the best things to try to manage that afterwards. Um, if there are spiky flavors but it's still drinkable, then just let it give it some time yeah. to age. And uh, yeah, those compounds will change a lot. So that, um, what was that again? It was, um, oh yeah, the really bottle conditioning. in bottle conditioning and sparkling mead. Any suggestions? Um, yeah, so when I've done this at home, um, the problem with, um, sometimes you might want your mead sweet, um, and, but, but by the end of fermentation, your mead's gone too dry. Uh, your answer then is to back sweeten. Um, but if you, if you want to hit the right sweetness level, um, and what you can do is uh, you can, you can, package your mead early and let the fermentation continue inside the bottle that's cool that's a little bit more dangerous that's that's proper bottle conditioning right that, and that, that's that, that's proper a... bottle conditioning if you're going to do that with mead i would suggest getting um some bottles that are graded to really high pressures so that you're substantially reducing the risk of having bottle bombs um so buy yeah. some good hefty like champagne bottles um or you can keg it as well if you got if you got a corny keg at home or something yeah, like yeah. that. The other side of it is, um, but just going back to this bottle conditioning thing, and then um, once you've once you've reached the right um, carbonation that you want and the right sweetness level, um, you pasteurize. I'm talking about pasteurizing. Yeah, you can pasteurize. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's there's two sort of methods with bottle conditioning. One, as James says, is uh, you know catch it just before it's uh, the fermentation's finished. Uh, put that into a bottle allow that to carbonate in the bottle. That can be a little bit more difficult if you don't know the yeast and you don't know exactly how it works, you don't know exactly how far it's going to go. Yeah. Um, but a good thing of that is if you just want a dry carbonated bottle, you know, you could catch it at 10.02 and then you know those two points are only going to create, you know, that much or, but even then it can go down lower than, than 10.02 and it depends how far the yeast attenuates. So the best way for me is to prime if you want to go dry. So run it, let it run completely dry um, and then prime put some sugar in the bottle <clears throat> so there's the calculators out there you know like it's you know for me i use about three to four grams worth of uh table sugar per uh 750 ml bottle and then that that yeast will chew through that sugar and just produce the right amount of carbonation for your bottles and that way you know there's only that much sugar that you've added and that's only the amount of co2 it can produce that's yeah that's the safest way that's the that, safest yeah, yeah. way the other the other one is um to uh, to back sweeten the same way, but if you want a, a sweeter than a dry mead, then it's it's like we all like I did when I first started home brewing was you know you would have your your, your bottles all filled up and uh, I think I was brewing beer at the time, and I would come in after work every day and just open up one bottle, and I'd have that as soon as I come home and I pour it out and I go oh the carbonation is not quite there yet. So I leave it and I come back and I go there. It's like the next day and it's just gone from not quite there to too much. I'm like, cool, now I take that over and I pasteurize it. And that's kind of uh, the, the, the scary process of back sweetening a lot is that, you know, that fermentation doesn't necessarily grow, yeast grow uh, exponentially. So as they start pr to produce, you know, the little bit of CO2, little bit of CO2, too much CO2. And then that's where you're going to have bottle bombs. But if you come home and checking regularly um, and then pasteurizing. So... Pasteurizing at home can be a little bit difficult. We've tried lots of different methods because we, we really do like pasteurization here. We don't use it for everything, but we really like... But we can pasteurize safely here because we have a flash pasteurizer. Or we have a, a nice bath pasteurizer. And that's yeah. what we tried to create at home is a bath pasteurizer where you put your bottles into water. That helps raise up the temperature above 60 degrees. So pasteurization is just time over temperature. So once you hit 60 degrees, you'll uh, start to slowly kill the yeast um, the higher you get, the quicker the process is. So at 100 degrees, it'll take you know, 30 seconds to yeah. kill it. At 60, it might take half an hour or 45 minutes to kill it. Um, this, this is quite a technical process as well. So if you're yeah. doing this at home, 
um, you're gonna you're gonna stuff this up a few times. Do um, do as much research as possible into pasteurization and how to do it safely. It's super dangerous. You're playing with pressure, hot water, and glass, um, and that's just not necessarily something we condone doing. Home, yeah. home brew wise at home so the way that I, i've done it at home is uh got a pot on the stove <laughs> i don't know if i should be telling this story uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's too late, <laughs> it's too late now. now uh pot on the stove i've got uh one bottle full with, filled with water up to the same level that i've got everything else at i keep them at the same temperature um i get my water up to about 80 degrees i put all my bottles in there with a bottle of water with no cap i put a thermostat into that so I can read the temperature inside the bottle. Um, once that gets above 60 degrees, um, I have my little uh, spreadsheet that tells me, but realistically, if I was you, get it up to about 75 degrees Celsius um, and then hold it there for about three minutes. Yeah. And you will be pretty much guaranteed. But the thing is pressure inside a bottle when you heat things up, uh, it expands. So you're not only just adding the pressure of the CO2 that was produced, you're also adding the pressure of expanding that we could. So the weakest point is usually the cap. So if you're uh, pasteurizing at home, cover your bottles. Cover your bottles. Don't, don't stand over the top and look and go, oh, you know, it's like, it's like yeah. looking down the, the, the barrel of a gun, you know, like it's just. Face away, eyes away. All the time, you know, we're we're we're, we're protective post, yeah, goggles. Like we do it here, you know. Even though we do this every single day when we bath pasteurize, we still lose two or three bottles that that uh, you know got a little bit more yeast than the rest, or you know, just uh, you know had a weaker cap, or we you know didn't didn't cap as well as 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 we should have, and they'll pop. And when they go, they go. We've yeah. got a hole in the roof where we wanted to see <laughs> another story we shouldn't probably tell, but we wanted to see how far we could push these bottles, like. They say they're rated to seven bar, but are they? Yeah. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, but once you try to pasteurize it to stop the fermentation. So if you are going to do this at home, get um, high pressure graded bottles. When you're packaging, cap, cap the bottles really well. And when you're pasteurizing in the kettles, make sure you, you're, the bottles are covered with a weight maybe on top of the lid or the cover. Um, and just, you know, no, no kids in the house. Let everyone know what you're doing yeah. so that they don't, you know, open the lid, look in. Um, but generally, so, as long as you follow those steps, wear protective equipment as well. If you follow those steps, you should be okay with pasteurization. The, uh, the other thing, uh, so we're talking about bottle conditioning as well. Yeah. So um, letting meat, meat age on the lees or on the yeast is great. Uh, adds a bit more character, adds a bit more of that, that, that yeast character. So if you're bottle conditioning at home, pick a good yeast. You know, you don't want to be bottle conditioning on bread yeast. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you, you probably don't really want to be uh, bottle conditioning on on uh, on like a mead yeast or. Oh, well, yeah, you kind of do, but as long as you stick away from from anything that's got too much yeast character, unless you're looking for that. Um, but yeah, then once once you've got those sort of stable in bottle, then you know they'll, they'll last quite a quite a long time. Yeah, that goes that goes back to one of the questions we got as well. But how long can you age mead in a demijohn? Me, I mean, it, it would just get better. Yeah, as long as you keep the oxygen now, keep your bubbler filled, um, there, yeah, let it go. There are, um, this goes back to aging on the, the lees as well. Um, I've only had good, good outcomes from letting my mead sit on the lees, on the yeast. Um, it, it just adds over time that the, the yeast will sort of um, uh, decompose, kind of, but it, it just kind of adds so creaminess just... into the mead. It's, it's, it's all good stuff. Um, if, if you're concerned in any way, then just rack your meat off the yeast, let it age separately. Uh, but yeah, just just let it go. It'll it'll just get better. So um, hopefully we answered that question. If not, send us a uh, a um, an email to podcast at gosnells.co.uk and uh, we'll jump on that and we'll try to help you out. Um, I just realised you pulled this earlier and we never talked. Yeah, about no, it. we never talked about it. So <laughs> this is so uh, this is the tapache. So the first one that we tried. This is the tapache that we made. Um, so I really wanted to get back to this and go, okay, where do we go right? Where do we go wrong? Uh, and what would you do next time we did this? So just to give an overall of this, we did this almost like the same as the ginger beer where it's actually a, um, a wild fermentation using the pineapple skins to create a ginger bug. This is up on our, uh, on our Instagram as well. 
Uh, Hector, one of our assistant brewers. Hi, Hector. He's always here watching. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Omnipotent. Yeah. Um, he, he did a video for this to show everybody how to make a really cool tapache uh, at home. So he did a wild fermentation on that. And then uh, instead of using sugar, uh, we used honey. Uh, and then I think he added some spices as well. Yeah. So um, just to go back, this, this, this is using the yeast, the natural yeast that's on the skins of the pineapple mm -hmm. to ferment this. And then using the flesh in the body as well for some of the sugars and some of the acid as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's put our nose in. I mean, it smells amazing. It smells great. They're like, they're, they're... <laughs> it's not as much pineapple, right? And that's kind of one of the things when I had the tabache from Wild Beer and I was like... It's got the signature, what? it's got the signature, it's lactobacillus, isn't it? On this, it's got the signature lactobacillus. It almost smells a little nose. bready as well. Like it's, it's a little, it's, bit, it's, bready, a little yeah. bit way more funky than like Wild Beer's got like a lots of... Uh... Oh no. And we're back. Oh God. So our internet just died a little bit. Um, which actually happens to us more than we'd like to admit. Yep. So um, we'll just wait for everyone to jump back on and we're just going to taste through this tobacco together. Yep. So uh, but yeah, it's got that amazing like, acid, pineapple acid. Yeah, that's really more prevalent than it is in the other one, isn't it? It's really, a lot yeah. more, it really smells like, like, like acidy pineapple. The sweetness helps as well. So welcome back, guys. Sorry about the... Uh, the uh, the interruption. The interruption. The internet died. But we're back. Yeah. Um, so so we, what what would we do different? What went right? What went wrong? Uh, for me, it's maybe under attenuated a little bit. It's still very very sweet. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. Not that I'm a, you know I like I like the sweetness, but there it's a bit too sweet for me. Other than that, this I don't think this can come out better because this has um, got so much of that. Uh, lactobacillus flavor in there and you've all, which is that kind of like sharp acidic um kind of flavor and you've also got so much of the pineapple characteristic in there as well it's nice, yeah and it's sharp it's and sweet. it's held up too so we did this over summer yeah and this is this is held up in that in that time as well like it hasn't really lost the pineapple character too much um and the recipe for this is on our is on, is on the gosnells yeah yeah it? but um what yeah so probably the yeast attenuation probably went wrong what went right was the yeast character is spot on the the fruit level spot on um the acid profile is really nice but like you're saying that would actually be a little bit better if it was a little bit drier mm -hmm. um going back what would we do to fix that next time do you think um maybe i'd say to get the attenuation maybe add, add some yeast maybe yeah, so doing like a like a second pitch. Yeah, um, just to, just to munch up some of those sugars, or maybe even instead of using, you know, so maybe we do because uh, it, 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 it's hard to cultivate that that kind of that wild yeast, isn't it? Yeah, That's and it's also there. you know it's kind of luck as well. So I think we'd probably try it again, uh, see if we get better yeast next time. Maybe even um, creating that starter, maybe just feeding that starter a bit of yeast as well That's and getting one, that yeah. into the to the mixed fermentation get, in that. Get, getting it healthy, getting it going. Give it then, a little bit more time to build up and get a little bit stronger so it really chews through that fermentation. Yeah. But, um, yeah, going back to what I said, I was, I was going to go through my best and worst homebrews. Uh, best homebrew I did was the, uh, the first time that I ever used uh, Kavik yeast. And I was like, okay, I want to see what this thing can do. Um, so middle of summer, whole lot of orange blossom honey, and just like I, I chucked in some uh, some Voss uh, when it was just it was first coming out, and it just I, I got a, a little smack pack of it, and I was like, go with that. And it was the, one of the most incredible meads that I've ever made at home. Really? It just it smelled so tropical. Even trying to recreate it now, you know, we use a little bit of Voss here and a couple of other strains of Kavik as well. Trying to recreate what I did in that scale, I just can't get it there. And and it's just one of those ones where I think I have one bottle of it left and I, I don't want to touch it. It's just, you know, it's only I only got like maybe five bottles out of it. Yeah, right. Um, but it was perfect. I couldn't I couldn't imagine um that it was ever going to turn out that nice, you know. When you read things from, you know, on forums and and uh, how are we doing, guys? Everyone, everyone's back on. It's great to see you all back. Sorry about the interruption. Um, yeah, and it, it's just one of those ones where I, I don't know what I did that made it as it as it was, and I just can't seem to recreate it. And for home brewers at home, I do it for a living, and sometimes I just go, 
dump all that together and I go, cool, that's going to be fine. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, of course it's going to be fine. But what happens if you really love it Yeah. and you can't recreate it? Like I don't know. I can't remember. I know I used tartaric acid. Uh, I know that I pitched. Uh, uh, I know that I uh, pitched it um, the full amount of sugar in there. To be honest with you, I can't remember the original gravity. It's around ten ninety or ten ninety two. Um, so it's quite strong meat then. Quite it? strong. It's coming out about ten percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I've got one of the bottles from because I did three trials. So I got three different yeasts. I got uh, the Voss. I got the uh, Hornadale. Yeah. And then I got this, the Hothead. So the worst homebrew I ever did um, was uh, trying to um, make a cup of tea. <laughs> trying to make a cup of tea, yeah. Uh, trying to do a, a full spontaneous fermentation with some honey I got from uh, Bermondsey Bees up in Bermondsey. Uh, incredible beekeepers, incredible urban beekeepers and, and Go and taste that honey. It's it's beautiful. Uh, so I got a couple of kilos of that, and I was like, you know what? This this honey needs to be respected. Uh, I'm not going to do. Uh, I'm not going to pasteurize it. I'm not going to uh, pitch yeast over the top. I'm going to use the yeast that's inside. And as it was going, I did it in an open top fermentation, um, uh, untemperature controlled. I just mixed uh, um, uh, distilled water with the honey and nice. put nothing else in there left it open top and then just let it run. And <clears throat> it tasted incredible about three quarters of the way through the process. It was like the lacto just went crazy first up. So I was super tart, um, but it, it just, uh, it, it was just really round and full and sweet and sour and it smelled like really floral and it was incredible and I just let it go. And I was like, cool, let's get this a little bit less sweet and then bang and just started smelling like nail polish oh god and i think it's not the worst thing i ever made but it was just the disappointment of having something so incredible and i just went no i'll just give it a little bit more time just to chew through a bit more sugar i left it open top so i had lots of oxygen and i really should have at that point grabbed it transferred it into a demijohn and then put a put a cap on it and and done a half oxygen open air uh fermentation and the other half uh, in a in an uh, anaerobic environment, so one aerobic three quarters fermentation, twenty five percent anaerobic, and it just it still sticks with me now, uh, just because it was awesome and yeah. I ruined it because I was, you know, oh, I just want more, I want more, yeah, I want yeah, more yeah. instead of just being happy with what I had. But uh, but yeah, so out of the uh, the three trials I did, this hot head was the worst. Okay, uh, it's not bad, and uh, we'll have a little bit of a trial of it. But what I found with the, the Hothead versus the Voss or the Hornadale uh, is that it just tasted a little bit more like beer. And I kind of didn't want that. Sure. I didn't expect it. I know it's, you know, they're all ale yeast and they all have a little bit of that sort of character, but this has a lot more of that character. I'll tell you what, that, that Voss is amazing. The Voss is great. Yeah. Like this, this smells kind of similar. It's a little bit more, it's got a little bit more high alcohol. Uh, you may have answered this already. Uh, uh, any tips on calculating how much honey to use when back sweetening? So it depends on your palate. So your perception of sweetness would definitely be different to mine, and mine is definitely different to James's. Um, a good way to look at it is probably, you know, if you add about 50 grams per litre, you're going to get something around about, 10, 15, yeah, and 16. Like yeah, yeah. And, and that's probably, you know, a good range. Um, and then once you've done that, then figure out, okay, I put 50 grams in. Oh, that was too sweet for me. And then you've got, you know, somewhere to start working from. And, oh, you can go, it's not sweet enough, and then double that or add, you know, yeah. another 25 grams per liter. So just incrementally, because it's hard to answer that question straight at the back because you're talking about how much it's hard to know because we need to know how much uh, liquid there is. How yeah. Much you're also, what but the ABV is as well. What the ABV is, and there are different things that come into play. But if you just add honey incrementally, um, and then just taste it each time, yeah, so start off small level. as well. So yeah, like you're saying, you can actually add them straight after each other as well. So you can add your fifty and go, okay, I see how much how much sweetness that's gained. I just want a little bit more. Yeah, and you can always so add more. Then maybe to then maybe you add another fifty, or you add twenty five grams, like. Just keep, yeah, just keep adding little bits of honey until you kind of get but to yeah, start, to Yeah, I, I think start off with 50 and it might be too much. 
Um, but yeah, that, that'll give you somewhere to start. Great. Um, but yeah, I think we're running over time here, James. So let's finish up on this. And uh, guys, just to let you know as well, we have our crowdfunder where we're, I think we're about 90% of the way through that. So if you haven't uh, jump on that. Uh, we send four of our small batch mead. A lot of the stuff, not necessarily here. We didn't want to bring some of the, the things that are actually going to pull into the small batch program. But our homebrew side and our small batch are quite linked where we spent a bit of time over the summer creating all these weird and wonderfuls. Um, and and now we want to start scaling those up and and, and get them into can and, and be able to push them out to people and, and just get people excited about mead like we are. And I think the best way to do that is just show the diversity of the category of mead. And how, how, is, how is the small batch program going to work? Uh, so you'll get four cans each month. Of We'll do one brew each month and you'll get four of those cans delivered to your door. Okay. So it's as simple as that. So jump on there. It's, uh, yeah. it's on our website. Uh, there's stuff on our, on our Instagram. Um, but yeah, just jump over to gosnells.co.uk and uh, have a look. And if you want to try some of these meads with us, well, we're also tasting our small batch program uh, and some of the, the other stuff every Friday here as well. So if you want to be part of that, then jump on, grab, grab, a, grab a bit of that. So the first one that we're going to do, and we finally decided a couple of weeks ago, we were like, what are we going to do for our first batch? And we decided to go full, full mead forward um, and just go the craziest thing that, that we come up with, which is actually our gluten-free braggot, um, which I'm super excited to make. So... Uh, Braggot James is uh, just style of meat or style of beer. Hard to say, really, but it's um, a braggot. I think is half fermentables uh, come from barley, just like a normal beer, and the rest is made up of honey. Um, there, are, there are different rules depending on what country. But it's basically yeah, so like it's beer, grain, it's grain and honey. So half of your sugars come from the grain, half of the sugars come from the honey. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we, as a gluten-free uh, meadery, um, we can't use wheat barley i i don't even really want to introduce oats in uh, you can get oats from a facility but there's some other stuff with we're that away, we're, we're staying away from from gluten but you know as there is gluten bread that means there's gluten-free grains so uh we did some trials well we've actually been doing trials on this for probably 12 months yeah yeah and we finally nailed our recipe with, um, with sorghum with sorghum so oh. sorghum some other stuff some honey picked our yeast we're gonna we're gonna do some fun with it so that's going to be our first uh, small batch release. Um, so guys, uh, I think it was Ian, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Um, so guys, if you've got any other questions, um, email us at either contact at gosnells.co.uk or podcast at, uh, at gosnells.co.uk or if you jump on our website, there's a little uh, message icon down the bottom hit that um, we all sort of keep an eye on that so if you catch one of us we'll just have a little chat with you and and go through it or you know even just dm us and uh and yeah we'll get back to you what uh, what what have we got planned for next week so next week yeah next week is really exciting actually uh next week we have tom uh tom wilson we'll from... probably have we'll probably have uh tom gosnell back as well next week okay, so true, yeah. don't let that deter you we've got another tom you can choose the between the two um <laughs> Uh, so we're getting Tom Wilson from uh, Kampai uh, to come in and we'll taste some sake and we'll talk about sake, which is just a really, really cool fermentation process. So really it cool, actually yeah. goes like beer, you do an enzyme process and then you do a fermentation process. Something sake like that, is really yeah. cool because that process is happening at the same time. So they're doing the, the, the enzymes it? are creating the sugar as the yeast are then eating that sugar. And what do you call it? You call it a dual, dual conversion or something like yeah, that? Yeah, or a dual fermentation. Dual fermentation. Co -co no. Uh, we're, this we're is not, this is why we this, need Tom. This is why we need Tom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no. Next week we're going to cut through that. They, these guys started in Print Village. We did a collab with them uh, two or three months ago. I think some of it's still on our website. Um, but yeah, guys, thanks for sticking around for the extra fifteen minutes. We had a little bit of a delay, but I hope uh, I hope you guys had fun. Uh, we certainly did. Um, what was the other one we had here? Let's 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 finish on that one, James. Cool. Uh, so this one here. It tastes nice, a little bit too sweet. Um, I just don't like the beery character. This one, by the way, guys, is a wild homebrew that I did from picking flowers out in our uh, parking lot outside. I just grabbed whatever flowers this summer was in season, 
chucked it into a um, Erlenmeyer flask with a um, with a um, simultaneous fermentation. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we chucked that on a stir plate, um, and then just let that run, build up the yeast culture, fed a little bit of honey, fed a little bit of honey, brewed five liters and it came out like apple pie. It was cinnamony. It was, it was incredible. That was, that, that was, that was one, that was quite an amazing experience, by the yeah. way. Just like making, mixing honey and water together, making a mass and then you just going... Oh, what's this? And then just picking some flowers. I got, I got some in. rosemary off our bushes outside. I got a couple of bay leaves from our bay tree. And it was honestly just like drinking apple pie after it fermented. It was, it was incredible. Amazing. So, so this is the second iteration of that. So after we made that, I racked it off the leaves uh, and then leaving the leaves in there and I just dumped a whole lot of must on top of it, put, a, put an airlock on it and let it go again. So what have we got this time, James? So it still retained quite a lot of the apple pie. Yeah, character. a lot of the apple pie carried a little bit um, less on the, uh, the spices. Pie, I'm not just talking about apples. I'm talking about that kind of buttery. Buttery, spices, yeah, fresh yeah. apple, a little bit of caramelized apple there too. Um, it smells nice and sweet. It smells nice and honey. Well, James, cheers. Cheers. Cheers to you guys. Thanks for, thanks for, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for the questions. Oh, it's bone dry. Oh my god! Yeah, it's it's got a bit of tannin structure. It's nice and round. Yeah, that smells super sweet in the nose, but bone dry on the palate. I think the alcohol must be a little bit higher as well because it has that's got quite a lot. Of body, yeah, yeah, quite a lot of body. I now. think this is about six, seven percent now. So going back to what we were talking about fixing the tapache, um, about just growing that starter a bit. The first one was a bit sweeter. Um, it just didn't attenuate as far, and when we racked again, uh, it just those yeast started to attenuate further. They, they, they grow in generations. Mm. Uh, they, they evolve a little bit, and they've definitely chewed through all that sugar. Um, it's probably a little bit thin. Yeah, so this is, this is one of those scenarios where you'd want to back sweeten. Yeah, 100%. To this back sweeten with, uh, with some nice raw honey. That would be amazing, yeah. I, I think that would be the goer. So, guys, thank you very much for stopping by again, and uh, see you all next week. Have a good weekend, guys. 